Κυρίε και κυβέρνηση, κυρία Ελένη Δουδουλάκη, εκπρόσωπε του Αρχιεπισκόπου Αθηνών για Πάση Ελλάδα, αδιασημότατε πρωτοπρεσβύτερα πατέρα Ηλία Δροσινέ, αξιότιμα εκπρόσωπε του Αρχηγού τη Μίζωνο Αντιπολίτευση, κύριε Βερναρδάκη, εξοχότατε πρώην Πρόεδρε τη Δημοκρατία, κύριε Προκόπη Παυλόπουλο και συνάδελφε, αξιότιμα εκπρόσωπε του Αρχηγού Διεθά, υποστράτηγε Ιωάννη Δημητρέλη, εκλεκτή προ και κλειμένη, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι ακαδημαϊκοί. Αφού καλωσορίσω όλους σας πρώτα τους συνέδρους και ύστερα όλους εσάς που μας τιμάτε με τη φυσική τη διαδικτυακή παρουσία σας, θα πω πολύ λίγα λόγια για το σημερινό μας συνέδριο, το μέλλον του παρελθόντος, η σημασία των κλασικών σπουδών σήμερα. Όπως ξέρετε αυτό το συνέδριο συνδιοργανώνεται από την Ακαδημία Αθηνών και την Ακαδημία Επιστημών της Χάιδελβέργης, ο πρόεδρος της οποίας... Ήταν να είναι μαζί μας σήμερα, δεν μπόρεσε τελικά, αλλά μας έχει στείλει ένα, μια, ένα βιντεοσκοπημένο μήνυμα και παρακαλώ τους τεχνικούς να παίξουν αυτό το βίντεο με τον χαιρετισμό του κ. Σάιντ Μίλλερ, του Προέδρου της Ακαδημίας της Χαϊδελβέργης. Dear Professor Rengakos, dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure for me to send you my greetings by video message today. Your conference focuses on a great topic that has been of interest for many centuries. The real present and the expected future of knowledge and research in classical antiquity. Athens is the best place for this topic. Although classical antiquity has long been part of the heritage of all humankind on earth, its origin is associated with Athens and with the Greek polis. Of course, Rome and the Latin literature of antiquity also claim an important place in this past. However, Greek scholars may rightly point to the takeoff in Hellas, certainly an important turning point in the history of humankind. At the first glance, the idea of your Congress appears to be supra-temporal. The future of classical studies was already of the greatest interest in Paris in the 12th century or in Heidelberg around 1800 when Johann Heinrich Voss translated classical Greek works into German or in the democratic revolutions of the West which derive their roots from Greek democracy. The topicality of antiquity was always not based on antiquarian collecting, but aimed at the spiritual renewal of the present for a longed for future. Many generations of teacher of Greek and Latin have found their raison d'etre in the importance of classical studies for that future. I experienced this myself in my education at the German gymnasium. But now there is controversy about the legacy of the old white man. Decolonization will certainly change classical studies seriously. Mere preservation of traditions for their own sake no longer stands a chance. Who will have the interpretive authority in this ongoing process? You will critically discuss this is important question in the next few days. We are all looking forward to your results. I speak as president of the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Humanities in cordial connectivity with your Academy of Athens and with all scholars of classical studies. Professor Ringakos is a corresponding member of our Heidelberg Academy, and we are very proud of that. Parts of your conference were prepared together with members of our Academy, who are with you now in person and will speak in the next few days. We hope for a deepening of academic ties for both our academies, but also for the community of scholars around the world. The voice of classical studies is once again of great importance in our present time because the values of the humanities 
are being challenged in serious ways. We do not want to copy the history of Athens or Rome for our future, but we are curious to recognize the importance of past alterities. I wish you a stimulating conference and I look forward to evolve academic ties beyond these days. Thank you. Ευχαριστούμε έστω και από μακριά τον πρόεδρο της Ακαδημίας της Χαϊδαλβέρης και ελπίζουμε ότι η συνεργασία μεταξύ των δύο ακαδημιών θα συνεχιστεί και τα επόμενα χρόνια. Το συνέδριο, κυρίες και κύριοι, όπως ίσως έχετε διαβάσει, είναι αφιερωμένο στον καθηγητή, συνάδελφο, ακαδημαϊκό Νικόλα Οκονομή, τον Νέστορα της κλασικής φιλολογίας στην Ελλάδα, ο οποίος πριν από δύο περίπου μήνες συμπλήρωσε το εκατοστό έτος της ηλικία του και είναι σήμερα μαζί μας. Δεν χρειάζεται να πω περισσότερα για αυτόν, απλώς να του ευχηθούμε να συνεχίσει με τον ίδιο ενθουσιασμό να ασχολείται και να ενδιαφέρεται για την επιστήμη μας για πολλά πολλά ακόμα χρόνια. Μια δεύτερη παρατήρηση. Το συνέδριο γίνεται στην Ελλάδα, στη χώρα στην οποία το θέμα των κλασικών σπουδών θα έπρεπε να είναι πολύ ψηλά στην ατζέντα, όπως λέμε σήμερα. Ξέρουμε όλη την κατάσταση και τα προβλήματα της αρχαιογνωσίας στη δευτεροβάθμια και την τριτοβάθμια εκπαίδευση που χρονίζουν εδώ και δεκαετίες και επιδεινώνονται χρόνο με το χρόνο και όλοι έχουμε ακούσει όσα με περισσή υπερηφάνεια λέγονται από επίσημα και έγκυρα χείλη ότι οι κλασικές σπουδέ σε όλες τους τις εκφάνσεις αποτελούν τη βαριά βιομηχανία της χώρας μας ένα πεδίο στο οποίο η ελληνική έρευνα θα μπορούσε και θα έπρεπε να παίζει πρωταγωνιστικό ρόλο. Συνέχεια, όπως επίσης όλοι ξέρουμε, σε αυτά τα ευχολόγια δεν δίνεται. Spin-offs και startups, βλέπετε οι επιστήμοι μας, δεν μπορούν να προσφέρουν. Το συνέδριο της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών, ελπίζουμε, φοβούμε, φοβάμαι μάλλον μάταια, ότι θα δώσει τροφή για σκέψη και στους δύο αυτούς τομείς, την αρχαιογνωστική παιδεία αλλά και την έρευνα στις επιστήμες μας. Τέλος, οι συμμετέχοντες, οι έγκριτοι συμμετέχοντες στο συνέδριό μας ανήκουν σε διάφορες παραδόσεις και σχολές της αρχαιογνωσίας στην Ευρώπη και στις Ονωμένες Πολιτείες της Αμερικής. Είναι λοιπόν μια λαμπρή ευκαιρία να ακούσουμε από πρώτο χέρι ποια είναι ακόμα η σημασία των κλασικών σπουδών στην εκπαίδευση ή γενικότερα στην πνευματική ζωή των χωρών τους, ποιες είναι οι τάσεις που επικρατούν στην έρευνα, ποιοι οι καινούργοι προβληματισμοί, ποια ιδεολογικά ρεύματα τις διατρέχουν ή απειλούν να τις συμπαρασύρουν. Δεν θα σας κουράσω όλο, αλλά θα παρακαλέσω τον συνάδελφο ακαδημαϊκό Θόδωρο Παπαγγελή να πάρει το λόγο. Thank you, Adoni. You might believe that it takes, as in, as in tango, it takes two to declare a conference open. But the truth is that Antonis Dargakos did not want to hawk this solemn occasion and share the pleasure and the honor of it uh, with me. So, let me address a most warm welcome to all of you, whether present in this hall or in front of a screen and over a keyboard in other parts of the world. As you have heard, and as you may have noted, the honorant of this conference is Professor Nikos Konomis a teacher most dear to our hearts, a distinguished classical scholar, and a man of uncompromising honesty. As it happens, we celebrated the centenary year of his birth a few weeks ago, and we are glad that today you can join us in wishing him robust health and unceasing activity in his Virida Senectus. Professor Nikos Konomis. Well, Andonis has said most of what uh, I was intending to say, so uh, it's time to buckle down to work. I wish the conference every success. 
May the goddess of wisdom in whose city we have gathered guide our thoughts and bring our efforts to fruition. And may her sire put off the thunderstorms for next week. Thank you. Μπορούμε να αρχίσουμε με την πρώτη συνεδρία, νομίζω. Θα καλέσω τη συνάδελφο Σοφία Παπαϊωάννου, η οποία και θα προεδρεύσει. Εμείς αποχωρούμε. Ευχαριστώ και πάλι όλους σας για την παρουσία σας. Κυρίες και κύριοι συνάδελφοι, κυρίες και κύριοι επίσημοι, κύριοι οικονομοί, αγαπητοί προσκεκλημένοι, dear guests, dear colleagues, professor economies, our honoree, uh, welcome to this first uh, panel of uh, this very important conference. I feel very honored and humbled to chair this panel for uh, we have with us four distinguished classicists, four scholars whose work um, all of us have studied, been inspired by, uh, cited repeatedly, even tested on. And uh, I hope, and I'm pretty much sure that at the end of this panel, Several of us will have questions to address, uh, thoughts to share, and uh, come go away with uh, things to ponder on. Um, I suggest that we uh, hear all the four, all the papers first, and then save our questions for a general discussion at the end. And uh, without further ado, I call uh, the. First speaker, Professor uh, Hans Joachim Gerke, uh, who is Emeritus Professor of Classics at the University of Freiburg, who is a member of the Academy uh, of Heidelberg, a member of the Leopoldina Academy of, Heidel of Freiburg, and if I'm uh, correct, uh, he's also a corresponding member of the Academy of Athens, a fellow of the Academy of Athens as of last May. Uh, Professor Gerke, it's a great honor for us to be, uh, for the conference to open by you. Please uh, take the podium. And? Well, I repeat, that's okay. <laughs> dear uh, uh, colleague, dear Professor Konomis, uh, dear colleagues, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor not only to have the opportunity to speak on this occasion, but also to start this as a kind of uh, symposiarchos. My topic is uh, the ancient world, past, present, and future of Europe. Europe is a construction of the ancient Greeks. The beautiful princess, oh, I think, so, the beautiful princess of Phoenicia that Zeus in form of a bull abducted and took to Crete may be its symbol. This alone shows us that East and West were not rigidly divided then. But much more important than this well-known myth, however, was the intellectual measurement of the world 
carried out by Greek philosophers and scholars of the archaic period. Even today for us, the boundary between Europe and Asia is the same as the one that Anaximander, Hecateos of Miletus and others drew across the Hellespont and the two Bosphors. And yet this border is not the work of nature, but of man. It is a construction based on the rules and lines of geometry. This does, however, offer an advantage. A construction can serve us to work and build further if we ask ourselves what Europe is and above all, what is the deep connection that holds its inhabitants, the Europeans, together. The stones of this construction are primarily found in history. It is true in the case of any collective identity. In the case of Europe, however, this is true to a very special degree. Europe, that is its history. We should be aware of this in order to protect Europe and its culture and to further develop it for and into the future. European history consists very often of stories of painful contrasts and horrible conflicts. But when we understand the history of Europe as a history that belongs in common to Europeans, then what unites us consists in the fact that Europeans have always had common experiences in conflicts and in reconciliations. The events that concern everyone were experienced in different ways by different countries, peoples and nations. But all were separately <coughs> and together affected by them. They became their common destiny. In this sense, Europe is a community of destiny or destinies. Around these destinies, but also around many other things, there has been a dense exchange of ideas in Europe. And by virtue of this, Europe has also become a community of discourse. Let me therefore, let me therefore focus on the destinies that unite Europe's in history, Europe in history. In this regard, it is clear that we must go back to a time before the formation of nation states. One cannot emphasize this clearly enough. Europe, Europe existed before the formation of the modern nation states, which necessarily takes us back to antiquity. The culture of the ancient Greeks, the inventors of Europe, already became a world culture in antiquity, especially after Alexander's expedition. The contacts with the Near Eastern civilization from which the Greeks had already learned a great deal beforehand led to intensive processes of exchange. And in this configuration, Greek civilization was adopted by those who had subjugated Greece and the Hellenistic kingdoms, namely the Romans. Now, it is decisive for the history of Europe that the Romans adopted Greek culture, configured it according to their mentality and passed it on. It was the destiny of the first European civilization which had been formed in all its cosmopolitan potential in Greece to be further developed by the Roman Empire which in turn is a very special European community of destiny and a central core of, Ro of Europe. This can be shown through history itself. Contrary to what we commonly learn, the Roman Empire did not end with the end of antiquity. It is true that as a rule we speak often of the Byzantine Empire and that, as far as the West is concerned, we often speak of the German Empire. And this 
was in the tradition of Charlemagne's Frankish Empire. But from a historical point of view, hence from the point of view of the contemporaries of those past realities, this is inadequate. The so-called Byzantines were Romans, Romei, and even the modern Greeks could also be called Romyi. Charlemagne, after the transfer of imperial power to the Franks, the Translatio Imperii, bore the Roman titles of Imperator and Augustus. His empire was the Roman Empire. Decisive in any case was the fact that the Roman Empire was thought of as universal, namely glo as global unit, never defined, never in national or ethnic terms. The empire constituted a political and legal environment in which life could unfold with security. Characteristic of this circumstance is the great collection of law that Emperor Justinian had arranged, the Corpus Juris Civilis, important rules and principles of Roman law endure to this day and form an essential part of all our legal systems. Especially in Europe, after the breakup of the unity of the Mediterranean world, people remained tenaciously attached, even in fact, to the empire and its notion and idea. This also radiated on all those who were not directly part of the empire or even competed with it. And in short, the empire did not want to know about disappearing. After the great catastrophe of Constantinople, for instance, the third Rome originated in Moscow, while in the West, the empire was only abolished on August, August 6, 1806. Even after it came to an end, the Roman Empire survived to some extent as a universal notion. But above all, it was the ancient languages, Greek and Latin, that expressed the universality embracing these peoples and cultures. In their use as classical languages, they are still vital today in the best way all over the world. This strong ability to persist over time in the midst of change and at the same time this strength of influence of the empire and the notion of empire are also connected with religion. Despite persecution, the development of Christianity was sustained by the existence of the Roman Empire. With Constantine the Great, the church developed that was, so to speak, coordinated with the empire and like it, universal. It maintained this principle even when the empire partly disintegrated. In the East and West, the church has developed differently, also in its relationship to secular power. However, it has never abandoned the basic idea of universal unity. Here, too, there have been considerable tensions over the centuries between the powers and within the churches. The so-called investiture conflict in the Middle Ages, for example, led to a reception of Roman law on the part of the emperors and strengthened their positions against the popes. The kings of the developing nation state, like the king of France and England, joined in Rex Imperator in Suo Regno. The upheavals were even greater in the confessional age, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Severe conflicts and wars tore European countries apart everywhere. Not least the Thirty 
years war, a European world war, so to speak, created many controversial experiences and thus became a shared destiny. But this was also true for the solutions that also became widely accepted in Europe. The idea that the confessional wars should be extinguished by the superior power of the state led to the idea of state sovereignty and, in the end, to the modern national state. The principle became established in absolutism and was preserved in the principle of popular sovereignty. Behind the above aforementioned popular sovereignty lies a distinct common European tradition dating back to Greek antiquity. Let us not forget the word popular sovereignty is nothing but the literal translation of the Greek term demokratia. Nevertheless, our modern democracies are by no means a copy of the Athenian one. But without the latter, they would not have been possible. And the winding paths that led from ancient Athens to us form the core of a common European destiny. Decisive are not so much the legal administrative details as the underlying principles. The point is that individuals belonging to a political community decide autonomously on community matters. This implies that they subordinate themselves to certain rules that they have given themselves and that they themselves control. Law, nomos, legs. In this form, self-determination guarantees freedom. How wide the circle of individuals involved in decision-making processes should be was already the subject of heated debate and struggle in antiquity. And yet, already in antiquity, the basic principle was unambiguously admitted that this circle should encompass all those concerned, at least the male half of the population. The principle that the individuals making up a community should be involved in an appropriate form and should govern themselves was the core of the civic order in antiquity, also in Rome and in the Roman Empire. Indeed, it can be said that the empire in its immense extent could not only exist and function, could only exist and function because it could be founded on thousands of autonomous cities. Today in the European Union, we discuss the principle of subsidiarity, where subsidiarity means that as many issues as possible should be regulated with the involvement of the population at the base. It was in the cities of the Roman Empire that the very term citizen and city was born. In principle, these communities relied on free citizens, even in, if in fact it was often a small circle. Many of these cities also managed to survive the Kaisuras that marked the transition between antiquity and the Middle Ages, maintaining a certain autonomy. It was as early as the 11th century that what was essentially the ancient model of the city, founded therefore on a form of structured self-government, began to spread with impressive speed throughout Europe. Not only during the aforementioned religious wars and related conflicts, but also during the Enlightenment, the debate focused above all on what was the best state order, one of the central themes in ancient thinking, drawing on Plato and especially Aristotle, but also on Polybius, Cicero and Livy and others, 
the Enlightenment developed some key concepts. Central was the reflection on the sovereignty of laws, to which even the sovereign had to submit. Ideas such as the social contract and the constitution were affirmed. Ideas that were accompanied by concrete experiences that in turn became principles, especially the decisive principle of the separation of powers. With the American and French revolutions, these and other reflections and principles, as also the idea of human rights, acquired concrete effectiveness. From there, they began to spread with impressive speed in Europe and later in the colonies of European countries. We are in the first decades of the 19th century. It is in this period that the community of destinies becomes particularly recognizable. And I might remember and mention at this place the Philhellenistic movement of this period. This combination of difference and commonality, which is quite peculiar and transcends the idea of a nation state, is particularly noticeable in the discussions and debates that Europeans conduct among themselves or even with external interlocutors. Different are the opinions and positions, bitter the conflicts, but similar are the terms of the debate and comparable are the starting points and assumptions. Despite linguistic differences, the same language is spoken. In short, Europe is also a community of discourse. And this is evident with unparalleled clarity in the cultural sphere, in the arts and thought. The discourse that Europe carries on with itself and with others continues in many ways the ancient debates between Greeks and Greeks, Egyptians and Greeks, Persians and Greeks, Greeks and Jews, Greeks and Romans, and so on. Likewise, European culture is in dialogue with antiquity. Thus, renaissances occur all the time. For reasons of time, let me end with an example that is also particularly close to our Republic of Letters. Humanism, inaugurated by Francesco Petrarca in the form of a debate on classical Latin, thus acquired its own physiognomy, the connection between Latin and Greek, a connection that was realized above all in Florentine intellectual circles and was fostered by the presence of Greek scholars such as Demetrius Chalcocondylis. In this era of humanism and the Renaissance, classical antiquity absolutely became a yardstick. Under the banner of the Ad Fontes principle, antiquity became a model and the object of new research conducted with an unprecedented critical approach. The bearers of this culture were primarily scholars, but it was in the universities that the formation of the elites, of the officials of the principalities, themselves marked by an increasingly complex organization took place. Eventually, through gymnasiums, and high schools, humanism spread to the cities, overshadowing the old monastic schools. The common language was Latin, but the practice of translation was also widespread. Multilingualism was taken for granted. Translation was commonplace. One took note of one's own and the other languages used their respective different possibilities and thus expanded the spectrum of expression quite considerably. One could always understand 
each other. Diversity and unity, expansion and not obstruction of exchange. Europe spoke <coughs> and speaks about the same thing in different ways, respect, respecting the other and even the intraduisible. We, as historians and classicists, the modern Respublica Literarum, know something about lingue franche and translation. It is our task to repeatedly draw attention to the crucial point and to convey it to Europeans, namely that Europe has more in common than is usually believed because it is older, much older than its nation stage, which, nation states, which almost destroyed it. Since antiquity, it had grown up in diverse processes of exchange and demarcation, even in conflicts, a community of destinies. In this way, we can work for the future with our current work on the past. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gerke, for your uh, speech. Uh, it was a great start to the first panel that took us from the present, drove us back to the past, and then brought us again back to the future. Our second distinguished speaker of this first panel is uh, Professor Richard Hunter, a former uh, Regius Professor of Greek at the University of Cambridge and uh, I don't need to say more about Professor Hander. I think he has his own entry in Wikipedia. So, uh, Professor Hander, the floor is yours. Thank you for uh, being here with us today. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Can everyone hear me? The figure of Odysseus always comes to us freighted with an overload of significance, whether already in Athenian tragedy of the classical period, in the moralizing philosophy of the Hellenistic and imperial periods, in the overlapping pagan and Christian cultures of later antiquity, or in the vision of modern Greek poets. Odysseus is never just Odysseus. He is a repository for hopes, fears, and our creative imaginations. He is the go-to allegory, a man for all seasons, the man who must resist the temptations of a life of delusion and pleasure in favor of the pursuit of the truth and the true home of the wise and virtuous. A homecoming which, in being, as the poet says, a forgetfulness of all he had suffered, and in the, grip, and in the grip of the deepest sleep, very like death, may be seen either as a transport to a promised eternal blessedness or the calm death that many of us wish for, or of course both. He carries so much on his shoulders, and I will return to those shoulders later, we should hardly resist seeing in him the past and the future of the study of Greek and Roman antiquity. A drift, as some seem to think it is, without a compass, geographical or moral, with no obvious direction home and in constant search of a telos, both as purpose and end. Aristophanes of Byzantium and Aristarchus seem to have thought that they had found that telos, but very few have followed the grammarian's lead. Nowhere perhaps might we feel closer to this Odysseus than in Book 11 of the Odyssey, the book of the really dead set in a world freighted with the ghosts of the past, not entirely, you might think, unlike the Academy of Athens. Odysseus visits that past and its ghosts, and its ghosts tell him and tell us their stories, or fragments of them, never more than that. 
Nowhere in the epics is there such a rich display of other stories which might be told, but are here silenced. The underworld teems with the fragments and summaries of lost epic poems, which we will probably never recover. It is an echoing repository of story, replete with an overwhelming sense of how much we have lost and how much we could learn if only we knew how to and where to look. Book 11 itself has often been thought to be a palimpsested text, bearing the scars where different poems and different versions have been awkwardly stitched together, itself almost an image of the only view of the past we will be allowed to grasp, a past without flesh and bones, which always slips out of our hands like a shadow or even a dream, as the ghost of his mother slipped from Odysseus's grasp. Moreover, the stories which the ghosts tell are not, of course, unmediated. They come to us only indirectly, veiled by Odysseus's self-presentation and the spin he puts upon the evidence. We cling to what James Porter called a fantasy of classicism, the idea that we can be in direct contact with the great figures of the past. But Odysseus, like us, must be selective both in his attention and in his narration, in his, if you like, presentation of the evidence. Book 11 is a paradigmatic lesson in the difficulties of interpreting the texts and objects we are lucky enough to have because they have somehow, unlike ourselves, escaped death. Not, of course, that this is a concern limited to Book 11, as very many of you in this room know well. The Odyssey as a whole teaches us still crucial lessons about reading comparative na competing narratives of the past and of how imaginative fiction can be more real than alleged documentary history and how we always ourselves have to fill in the gaps in order to make any kind of sense of what we are told. The loudest silence of all in Book 11 is these days rarely commented upon, but it was discussed in antiquity. The ghosts of the past are not all dead white males, but where are the Trojan ghosts, the psuchai of such as Hector and Andromache? Homer's underworld, or rather Odysseus's, shuts out the other, the peoples of the East, for example, as surely as classical studies is so often accused of doing. Porphyry suggested that this was an act of kindness by Persephone, who did not send up any Trojan ghosts because she knew of a mutual hostility between Odysseus and them. And Eustathius, blessed be his name, regards this choice of Homer as convincing Pithanos for similar reasons. Virgil presumably reflects such discussion in Aeneid 6 when he brings the ghosts of the Greek warriors of Troy into Aeneas's field of vision, but then scatters them nameless and terrified. The teeming ghosts are certainly there in the interstices of the Homeric text. When Odysseus tells Achilles, or rather does not tell him, of his son Neoptolemus's role in the sacking of the city of Priam, we can hardly fail to recall the cyclic story of Neoptolemus's savage killing of Priam at the altar of Zeus Herceos. Priam's ghost is indeed there, both revealed and concealed in the deliberate web of Odysseus's words. As so often, Homer shows us how to read the suppressions and deceptions with which we are presented every day, particularly by those in positions of authority. All visions of the past are partial, not just because we lack the necessary evidence, but because, although this too is a partial explanation, all viewers of the, of the past are themselves partial. Be that as it may, classics, and I will continue to use this term in this lecture and indeed beyond this lecture, though it now seems to require an apologetic footnote, just such as I've just given it. Classics is not, of course, just a matter of just seeing corpses, as Tiresias asks Odysseus why he has come to do on this other journey. 
but it is hardly surprising that the notion of classical studies as a kind of necromancy has often floated up the trench, very ghost-like itself. Even Vilamovic succumbed to the romantic temptation. Take Sophocles' last play, the Oedipus at Colonus, full of Odyssean structures and echoes. Somehow it seems right that this last play has, as, has at its center a blind man who carries the weight of tradition and the past with him, a reflection modeled in part upon the Tiresias whom Odysseus meets in the underworld. The blind man who takes his secrets to the grave ends his journey here in Athens, surrounded by, sac by sacred figures and terrified old men, not at all like the Academy of Athens on this occasion. As for Tiresias himself, the one man whose phrenes and noos remain intact post-mortem, he was to become the deathless embodiment and bearer of pagan Greek tradition, both immemorially old and ever renewed, the prophet of the past and the future, who in his blindness has seen it all. Other models are available to us. Instead of Tiresias, there is Proteus, the half model for half parody of Tiresias, and perhaps the patron deity of the prose and poetry of later antiquity, which has seen such a wonderful revolution in attention in recent decades. Like Proteus, however, the sense of what our shared subject is can slip through our fingers. Anglophone classicists, at least, now encounter every day flattering siren calls to the grandiose delusion of a claim to an all-encompassing omniscience of everything which happens over the fertile earth, but one in which nothing is really understood. As anti antiquity understood, however, the sirens play upon man's innate desire to know and always know more. The sirens offered Odysseus both what was in his discomfort zone, the story of Troy and the Greek past, and things of which he had no knowledge at all, but for which he yearned. In the end, Odysseus needed a precisely measured trench in order to get the ghosts to speak just as he could only hear the sirens because of the, of the restraints which restricted entirely free movement. And classics, and here again the English term is, a, is a potentially misleading, as a demonstrably flexible institutional unit within the humanities, offers us a structure, an imperfect and restricting one certainly, to try to make those ghosts speak. We should ourselves, I think, be very cautious of abandoning our trench, a term of ambiguous resonance which I use deliberately, in the hope of finding a better vantage point from which to consider Greek and Roman antiquity. But here again, different choices face different academic communities. In one of the most famous parts of Book 11, Tiresias tells Odysseus of his own future after the killing of the suitors. But when you have slain the suitors in your halls, whether by guile or openly with the sharp sword, then go abroad taking a shapely oar until you come to men that know nothing of the sea and eat their food unmixed with salt, who in fact know nothing of ships with red cheeks or of shapely oars which are a vessel's wings. And I will tell you a most certain sign which will not escape you. When another wayfarer on meeting you shall say that you have a winnowing fan on your stout shoulder, then fix in the earth your shapely oar and make handsome offerings to the Lord Poseidon, a ram and a bull and a boar that mates with sows, and depart for your home and offer sacred hecatombs to the immortal gods who hold broad heaven, to each one in due order. And death shall come to you yourself away from the sea, the gentlest imaginable that shall lay you low when you are overcome with sleek old age, and your people shall be dwelling in prosperity around you. This is the truth that I tell you. These famously riddling verses have generated a huge modern bibliography, but not even that can blunt their mysterious power. 
Odysseus is told to go until he reaches people who do not know the sea and eat their food unmixed with salt, not apparently as we do for the sake of their blood pressure. Who are these people? You will be unsurprised to learn that ancient scholars came up with more than one answer to that question. One of the most powerful readings of these verses is that of Neoplatonist allegory, most familiar to us from the account of Porphyry in his third century on the Cave of the Nymphs. For Porphyry, the Homeric Odysseus is a man, but also the embodiment of a soul which has passed through every stage of Genesis in its wanderings and now returns to the real spiritual and intellectual world, far from the turbulent waves of everyday embodied existence. Those who do not know the sea and its salt are those beyond all the pains and salty bitterness of the material world. The soul has returned to its true home. Those, however, who have, with great struggle, sought to put the bodily passions and their pains behind them must make reparations to the gods of the material world by further struggle until they are so far from the sea that the tools which represent it, such as an oar, are utterly unknown. Then finally, the soul will be at peace in the intelligible world. Now, Neoplatonist allegory is not to everyone's taste, unfortunately. Some half a century or so before Porphyry, the Christian Clement of Alexandria had his own allegory to tell. When Odysseus is introduced by Athena in Book One, stuck on Calypso's island and wishing for death as he longs to see the smoke rising from his native land, this shows that he is one of those who, as being attached to the material world as seaweed to rocks at the sea's edge, has no thought for immortality, the truth, and our real homeland in God's heaven, where there is true light, but cares only for smoke, or as we might say, the banal smoke and mirrors of everyday deceptions. Both the pagan Porphyry and the Christian Clement bear vivid witness to why the constantly reinvented Homer at least still matters, and the basic idea upon which both, in their very different ways, elaborate that Odysseus stands for all of us in our struggles, and that the Odyssey is, as it were, just that, the paradigmatic Odyssey of all lives, is as familiar to us now uh, as it was in late antiquity. We can no longer, I think, do without the idea of life's Odyssey and of life as an Odyssey. These interpretations are striking manifestations of the persistent attempt throughout both antiquity and modernity to appropriate Homer, whether in whole or part, for particular intellectual and discursive agendas important to those proposing the interpretation. It was not difficult for ancient readers to find what they were looking for in the generous capaciousness of the Homeric texts. As is now well recognized, the journey to find people who do not know what an oar is and have no knowledge of the sea uses a folktale motif attested from several cultures. One such Greek story, usually told of St. Elias, is of a sailor who, wanting nothing further to do with the sea, traveled with an oar until someone failed to recognize it, and there he stayed. That story is in part an etiology for why chapels to the saint are found on mountaintops, though it would in fact be easy enough to produce a reading along Porphyrian lines. The saint finally reaches a place where he can contemplate and worship his God in peace, and there he stays. Many, however, see in the Odyssey story an implicit etiology for why Poseidon was in several places worshipped inland. But the planting of the oar is both a closural moment and the marker of new beginnings. In most such stories, the traveler settles down once the sea is so far away that people do not know it. But Odysseus will return home, and that is important. The more, however, that one reflects on this story, on the figure of Odysseus as, as we have noted, a kind of everyman or pilgrim, both in pagan and Christian readings, and on the importance of the sea to Greek identity. 
the more tempting it becomes to read Tiresias' words as indeed a mythic etiology for the more modern Greek diaspora and for the inextricably related idea of nostos, the very first word which Tiresias speaks to Odysseus after he has drunk the blood. The return to the homeland is always difficult or painful, as Tiresias predicts for Odysseus. In such a mythic reading, those who do not know the sea does not mean those who have literally never seen it, but those who do not yet understand what that signifies, who have not yet been exposed to what we might call the culture of the sea. If Odysseus carried an oar with him, Alexander carried the text of Homer. And the poems are, like Odysseus's oar, a potent, perhaps the most potent image of the spread of Greek culture, ancient and modern, and at least how that spread could be imagined. As for myself, I first read Homer in a country which has been one of the greatest beneficiaries of the Greek diaspora, Australia. And though I was offered the chance to read Homer, not because of the diaspora, but rather because I attended a school built very firmly on an English model, the significant Greek presence in Sydney, and even more so in Melbourne, meant that Greece soon came to seem not quite as far away as it might otherwise have done. The very first piece of real joined up Greek I read was Xenophon's account in the Anabasis of how to catch bustards in the deserts of the Euphrates. I suspect that this text is insufficiently engaged with modern social issues to qualify as suitable for beginners Greek classes today, but in 1960s Australia it seemed very exciting. If Odysseus and his oar can, on a macroscopic level, point us towards the Greek diaspora, towards the gnawing need always to seek new audiences and new places of settlement. The image has another smaller scale significance for those of us involved in the teaching of Greek studies, most notably, but not exclusively, ancient Greek studies. If the diaspora was, in many cases, forced upon Greeks by terrible and violent acts, Modern teachers of Greek studies are compelled to pursue an intellectual diaspora, the need to spread the word, to win over new recruits for the subject and the language of Poseidon, or risk, so it is always claimed, a fairly rapid withering. Whereas Tiresias gave Odysseus a clear sign, however riddlingly phrased, Odysseus was unlikely to meet two people who both called his oar a chaff destroyer, we are given no clear sign, just a snowstorm of ambiguous indications that we have now reached a point of decision. Moreover, although St. Elias stayed where he was, ex halos, away from the sea, Odysseus, like Plato's philosopher returning to the cave, perhaps the most famous other classical underworld where all those false shadows compete for attention, we, Odysseus will have, like us, to return to where he set out from, to see, as we would put it, to business. There can be no secure retreat. Even the mountaintop hermit will be plagued by uncertainties. How will we tell the false shadows from those of substance in the academic fairground of competing chances and potluck games? Many here will perhaps most associate those kinds of decisions with very difficult choices about the centrality of the ancient languages in the study of the ancient world. Certainly, there is no shortage of sirens offering advice in that regard. Tiresias's prophecy of Odysseus's death is pointedly set against Proteus's famous prophecy of Menelaus's post-mortem transportation to the blessed Elysian plain because he was married to Helen and was Zeus's son-in-law. Lucian was to grant Odysseus a place there also, but what kind of death might classics experience and how blessed is the afterlife which awaits our subject? Will it be a gentle one at the end of a long and prosperous, if rather complacent old age, with expenses paid transportation to the island of the blessed, 
the academic equivalent of a seat in the House of Lords, far from the turbulent waves of everyday embodied existence, as Porphyry might have described it? Or will it be the telegony model, death by a thousand stingray cuts, the constant seep of poison into the bloodstream of the subject, destroying it from within? One thing that I hope will be pursued at this conference is that we must not either imagine or wish that the future of the study of the past will be the same everywhere, any more than the critical orthodoxies and assumptions of our subject have been universal throughout the world of classical study over the last century and a half to go no further back. So too the challenges in different places are different. For one thing, the study of the Greek and Roman past is very differently institutionalized and very different la differently labeled in different countries. In France, Germany and Italy, classics and here the name really is an Anglophone misnomer, is a very different beast from the subject in the United Kingdom, where successive governments and administrations have downgraded the status of the humanities in schools and universities and eroded, and this is very important, the salaries of those who teach and research in the subject, while vastly increasing their workload, so that academic life is not necessarily as attractive as it once was, and this situation has been made much worse by the pandemic. Here in Greece, there are very real challenges to the study of Greek and Latin, which have, I think, though others here, of course, are much better placed than I am to speak, they have far more to do with the traditional and perhaps unique place of particularly ancient Greek in the school curriculum and, the, and with profound changes in society at large reflected in higher education than with the arguments about the subject which have occupied so much time recently in Anglophone countries. The reasons for, stu for studying Greek antiquity here in Greece cannot on any model be quite the same as they are elsewhere. And that simple fact should be properly acknowledged while there is also some hard thinking and hard planning about the future of the discipline here. As for the Anglophone world, this is hardly monolithic, whether socially or culturally, and the pressures driving debate about the future of the subject in the United Kingdom, let alone in Australia, must in many particulars inevitably differ from those in the United States. What is important is that those on both sides of the Atlantic learn from the variable experience and the mistakes and successes of those on the other side. So why does it matter? As countless generations of undergraduate essays have struggled to tell us, Odysseus's trip to the underworld proves not strictly necessary, despite what Circe tells him about this other journey and despite what Odysseus learns there about the past, the future, and we might think about himself. The view that the humanities, like Odysseus's trip to the underworld, are not necessary in the sense of necessary to the economic prosperity of the state is one which it is not hard to find, either openly expressed or veiled by soft words of apparent sympathy. We have sort of been here before, the Platonic Socrates famously banned poetry, above all Homer, from his ideal state. In the 10th book of the Republic, Socrates admits that he too is enchanted by Homer's poetry and would be glad to be able to allow it a place in the ideal city, but only if it could be shown that poetry is not only pleasurable, but also beneficial in the well-ordered state. Enchantment is not enough. Poetry must also do us and the state good. It must be Ophelimon. In an extraordinary passage, Socrates memorably describes the irrational and emotional appeal of performed epic poetry as like the power still exercised over us by someone we once loved, but from whom we force ourselves to keep away because we recognize that this persistent desire is doing us no good. Are we to say the same of the classics and their study? 
How broad and long-term a view of the Ophelimon are we to take? One thing we can say in Socrates' defense was that he was much more concerned with the state of our souls than with the economic well-being of the state, with the inevitable inequalities that that concern brings with it. Memory and its loss is one of the great driving narratives and anxieties of our own age. We all take our daily dose of vitamin D in a desperate attempt to persuade the ghost of dementia to pass by our house or visit another. But we all sadly know those who have failed in that attempt. The awfulness of this illness has even spawned its own genre of jokes, just as the source of terrible fears and indeed memories do. In some contexts, memory is what we live by. Far from wanting to forget, we insist, and rightly so, that our children learn to remember wars and genocides, whereas Herodotus famously reports that the Athenians imposed a heavy fine upon Phrynichus because his drama on the capture of Miletus, quote, reminded them of their own misfortunes, and they appear to have tried to erase the memory of the play itself. Severe dementia is sometimes described as a kind of living death, and in the underworld, memory is erased, at least until the blood has been drunk. But the dead also charge the living with the preservation of their memory. It is easy enough to smile at Elpinor, a rather dim young man who had had too much to drink and killed himself by falling off Circe's roof when he asks Odysseus to build him a sema on the shore, quote, for even those who come after to learn of. This may be a delusion of grandeur, as Alfred Heubeck calls it, but Odysseus recognizes his responsibility to the dead and carries out Elpeno's request to the letter. At least as early as the fourth century before Christ, the tomb of Elpeno was shown and relevant verses presumably quoted in Campania, near where Circe's dwelling had been identified. Elpinor is one of history's little people, an entirely ordinary, forgettable person, a nobody rather than a no man, except that he should not be forgotten. We too owe it to the past not to allow that past to disappear, not ourselves to drink the dark water of Lethe, which wipes out individual and collective memory. The terrible events of this year in Ukraine are a stark reminder of how rem remembering the past is inseparable from and utterly necessary for considering the present. Without our often awkward attempts to make that leap of understanding of the past, society will become a bleak wasteland where we will no longer be able to talk to the ghosts, even after we have offered them our blood. Once gone, the memory and the knowledge will not return. Those of us who live, as I do, in a country which a few years ago chose retreat and isolation over openness, argument and engagement may well feel such, a da such dangers even more acutely. The Greek model, embodied in part in the building where we are seated, serves to remind us of the importance of such engagement and such remembering. So too the epic song of traditional cultures works to preserve that memory of the past, not just and not necessarily of historical truth, but of something much more important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hunter, for your talk. Um, our third speaker, um, I'm told that he's waiting on Zoom. There he is, Professor James Porter, Emeritus Professor of Classics at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. And uh, all the more so since I believe it is the day before Thanksgiving, right? So thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to join this conference, Professor Porter. Um, 
Your, the title of Professor Porter's uh, talk, The Future of the Ancient Self, picks up from where Professor Hander left it. The floor is yours. Thank you for joining Thank you us. Much. Thank you. Can you see the handout, first of all? Actually, I'm going to stop the share just to say hello. Oh. Um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers of this conference for the invitation to speak. And I'm sorry that, uh, and congratulations to Professor Kornomis on the celebration of his um, birthday. And I'm sorry that I could not attend in person, but I am not yet emeritus. So you'll see a little more of me in the future, speaking of the future of classics. Now, let me go share. I'll resume share. Um, it's telling me that my share screen sharing is paused. I'm not sure why. Oh. Let me try again. For some unknown reason, I'm unable to start the share. Could maybe the technical people put up the handout for me? Let me see if I can do this one more time. I might be able to. Okay, maybe here. No, I'm sorry, it's it's not sharing. Um, okay, um, I will just continue without the handout in that case. Mr. Porter, can you hear me, please? Yes. You have problem with the share screen. Um, we can see that you share the screen, but it stops all, all the time. It stops from you, not from us. Yeah, I'm pressing resume share. Please stop the share screen. Please follow these steps. Stop the share. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. share, click again to the share screen, to the green button. Click the screen. Uh, don't, don't share the document. Share the entire screen. The screen, not the document. Okay, let me try. I uh, stopped. Okay. Alfredo, open it for a moment. Let's see if we can No, we don't. Sharing. No, we can't see that. Okay. It's something from your computer. I can help you from here. If you can, you please send us to, to send you an email to send it to us to share it from here. Okay, I, did, I will I send you uh, through chat. You can start your speech and send, send it with uh, the email and we'll uh, share it from here. Okay. I sent, I sent it to Nikos already. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Okay, this is why I don't like Zoom, but anyway, I'll continue. Um, today, uh, I would like to present a few thoughts about where future studies of the ancient self might lead based on my next book project. Over the past several years, I've been teaching classes and seminars on conceptions of the self in antiquity and the contemporary present. The earliest of these bore the title the search for the ancient self from Plato to Foucault. I quickly gave up the search for two reasons. First, the self is an inherently problematic category, not an uninteresting one, and perhaps more interesting just for being so problematic. After all, modern philosophy from Kenan, Kenny to Dennett and Strawson has gone a long way towards renouncing the idea of the self which has been variously condemned as an incoherent postulate, a myth, 
a loose concatenation of capacities and experiences, an intuition without reality, or a grammatical mistake. Second, I came to appreciate that the ancients, at least in the tradition that concerns me most, were not searching for the self, but were abandoning it. And as I read my way deeper into the literature, my method of parsing the topic shifted. It went from a search for self to the problem of and with the self, and finally to what I call ecologies of the self, of self, nature, and community, as these are manifested in a tradition of ancient philosophy that runs from Heraclitus to the Stoics. Though I am certain that this model can be extended to culture and society more broadly construed. My case study today will be Heraclitus, since he is widely thought to have been the first author in the West to name the self as a distinctive entity and assigned a place of privilege and centrality in an individual's own doings. A self so conceived is precisely what my work is countering. In its place, a relational grid or network of constituents takes precedence, not selves then, but beings, enmeshed in relations with one another, all participating in a democracy of things. Contemporary environmental thinking is one promising route of access to the ancients, given the prominence of nature in their conceptions of the world, and given the dire straits that we find ourselves in today. The middle ground of my project is occupied by Socrates and the cynics, who operate in the civic equivalent of a natural world, a civic ecology. As I read them, they too are intensely relational beings engaged in and ultimately absorbed into their interactions and interdependencies with others, be this in the polis or in the cosmopolitan world at large. A concept that runs through all of these thinkers and that grounds their thought is that of the commons in Greek tokoinon. To anticipate my conclusions, as older models of liberal individualism descended from Hobbes and Kant cease to appeal to our intuitions of what it is to be and exist, future approaches to the so-called self of antiquity will shift. A realignment around writers from Bataille and Nancy to Latour and Viveros de Castro to Zakiah, Iman Jackson, and Fred Moten, but also less celebrated writers like Mary Midgley, will displace an older canon of literature on the self that has shaped the way antiquity has been read and continues to be read under the sway of modern individualism and liberalism. And contemporary approaches will be surprised to find resonances and even submerged inheritances in the pasts of Greece and Rome. Some of the larger historical pictures that continue to frame the problem of the self in classics will be familiar to everyone in this Zoom room. At one end, there is Bruno Snell, who in his Endequung Disgeistus from 1946, denies individuals until the classical period any sense of a unified identity. At the other end, there is Michel Foucault, who examines the production of subjective selves through spiritual technologies of the self. Foucault, for the most part, begins where Snell leaves off, with Plato. But their projects are strikingly familiar. Both paint a progressivist and gradualist picture of asceticism that comes into existence over the centuries and millennia. Both offer a genealogy of the modern subject. In the middle stands Bernard Williams, who locates the basic traits of agency and personal identity, very like our own, already in Homer. The stark binary choice between the gradual emergence of the individual subject, as in Snell and Foucault, or its original presence, as in Williams, is, I think, misconceived. On either view, the ancient subject appears as either unduly distant from ourselves or as unduly modern. Even so, the myth of the emergence and preeminence of the individualistic self in Greek antiquity after Homer continues to flourish to this day. And even recent revisionist philosophers from Nagel to Strawson to Damasio and Malibu, Catherine Malibu, who seek to qualify the reach of the self, end up only reinstating it, be this through 
a minimalist model of the thin self, a neuronal or neural self, or an objective self. Why is it so difficult to rid our minds of the idea of the self? Part of the reason seems to be rooted in our language. First person utterances are seductive. They imply a subject who must then be granted substantive existence. And in our phenomenology and our habits of thought, the feeling that we either have or are a self. But it is one thing to acknowledge that a sense of self may be ineliminable from experience, and quite another to endow the subject of that experience with either a substantive role in our lives or the privilege or attributes of singularity and discreteness, mental and psychological coherence, and autonomous agency. My point is not simply to challenge these reductions, but to ask in what name they are undertaken. The real issue is not whether attending to the self credits it with too much reality, but whether inquiries into the self credit it with too much significance. Nowhere is the over-attribution of meaning to the self more evident than in the efforts to trace the emergence of modern ideas of the self in Greek and Roman antiquity. The search, as it is to undertaken today, is in good part the legacy of an ideal of the self that was formed in the 18th century and was later cemented in polemical response to philosophical idealism. On a closer look, however, it can be shown that the ancient self, in many of its most significant formulations, was conceived not as a positive entity, be it subjective or objective, but only as an obstacle that had to be surpassed and ultimately left behind. In other words, what mattered in these cases was not the existence of the self, but its relative insignificance to a set of larger ethical or philosophical uh, projects. On the contrary, these representatives that I'm speaking of had larger goals in mind, questions about nature, the ecosystem, ethical responsibility, justice, and social critique that challenged narrow definitions of selfhood that typically required a stripping away of the self and of selfhood. Whether scanning the world in its unfathomable dimensions or gazing on the life of the polis in its inextricable complexity, they found it more useful to dispense with questions of what a self is and to focus instead on whatever calls into question the very coherence of the self when the self is viewed in isolation from its environment and as an end in itself. For Heraclitus, Socrates, the Cynics, and the Stoics, to give an account of oneself was not to give an account of one's self. What am I was not a Socratic question. What am I in relation to others was. Ethical motives then as now were typically selfless motives. Similarly, calls to unself the self, reflecting a basic exasperation with the self were frequent in studies of cosmic nature or in speculations about the divine. In these cases, the sun fades away into insignificance at the exact point where the universe becomes unintelligible. The latter disarticulates the former, rendering it opaque to itself, and for that reason takes precedence over it as well. Augustine's claim, I'd become uh, to myself a vast problem, quaestio magna, one he could never resolve precisely because it occupied a fleeting point of intersection in a much larger significant scheme of things, is completely characteristic of the ancient traditions that are of concern to me. Rather than tracking the individual emergence of an idea of the self in antiquity that we can recognize as our own, and rather than seeking to identify positive features of selfhood that may or may not converge with those that we believe we have, a different approach is needed. One that examines the ways in which the ideas of the self, ideas of the self were variously disarticulated and their coherence and importance were shown wanting. Which brings me to Heraclitus, whose frequent appeals to the suke in an apparently self-reflexive way have given rise to the consensus view today that any search for the ancient self 
must begin with his fragments. It is with Heraclitus, it is said, that the Suke emerges for the first time, as a quotation, as an integrated center of motor, cognitive, and emotive functions, end of quote, and as the locus of the true or essential self. To this consensus, scholars add a humanistic touch. With his new talk of soul, Heraclitus is a pioneer in human nature. Indeed, the actual goal of cosmic speculation and Heraclitus is said to reveal nothing less or more than, quote again, the meaning of human life. Not every reading of Heraclitus takes this approach. I will turn to some signal exceptions in a moment, but the vast majority do. And today, this progressivist approach to Heraclitus is the academic orthodoxy. Let me just see if I can share one more time. It may not work. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Three fragments in particular in one secondhand report attest to this new interest in the soul as a locus of the self. Each is dazzling. Um, Heraclitus, it is true, invites us to search for something like an idea of the self in his writings. He tells us that he made the search himself, um, or he writes, I sought for myself. It is the it is the main amalgam. The claim, I search for myself, tells us that Heraclitus went looking for himself, not that he found it, and certainly not that he went searching for his self. And the rest of the inferences about Heraclitus' so-called discovery likewise go much further than his texts warrant. Take the second text, which I'll read here. You would not find out the limits, the perata, of the suke, even by traveling along every path, so deep a measure, a logos, does it have, end of quote. Suke is apparently bounded, but we cannot reach its limits, no matter what road we travel to find them. Traveling looks to be a metaphor, but for what? Empirical inquiry can rule, be ruled out. Heraclitus notoriously scorned polymathy. Some other kind of inquiry could be intended. Self-inquiry or scrutiny through introspection is typically suggested by scholars to whom the image of interior psychological depths is attractive. But we may have gotten off on the wrong foot. There is no mention of introspection in the fragment and no sense of depth within, only a search for the unreachable limits of suke and a logos, a measure or account, that is itself illimitably deep. As Heraclitus says in another fragment, the logos of suke is infinitely expansive. It continues to grow. But why assume that the suke mentioned in these fragments is even that of an individual at all? A closer look is needed. Diogenes Laertius offers a convenient thumbnail sketch of Heraclitus's theory of nature. He writes that he is, his opinion, speaking generally, are the following, that things exist, are fitted together, all things are made of fire, um, but they are also contrary, and everything, he says, is full of sukai and divinities. The passage just quoted gives us the original context of the previous passage that I mentioned, everything is full of Sukai and divinities. Heraclitus's philosophy took in the whole of nature, starting with the elemental masses, earth, water, fire, um, as we learn elsewhere, and running up to the processes that govern them as they cycle incessantly to their transformations from one state to another. We also see how his theory gave extraordinary prominence to Sukai and divinities, seemingly attributing a kind of panpsychism and pantheism to every entity in nature, though exactly how remains to be determined. In each of these respects, Heraclitus has moved beyond his predecessors, but in one respect he has not. In Homer, the suke is a sign not of life to cool, but of life's precarious condition. Suke named only is named only in the context of life lost or threatened, never of life held or enjoyed. Suke represents the fragility of existence. In distributing Suke through the totality of nature, Heraclitus has distributed the same fragility throughout nature as well. Heraclitean reality is a living, changing thing, but it is 
at the same time, a dying thing as it cycles through patterns of change. And I just remind you of the quotation, mortals, immortals. The Heraclitean cosmos is best seen as a matrix of relations among unstable and seemingly ephemeral identities that exhaust themselves, not only in successive physical transformations of cosmic masses or stuffs, but also in simultaneously, simultaneous oppositions, whereby each component, considered from another angle, is its opposite. Thus, war is peace, up is down, life is death, and so on. In other words, the constituents, entities of the universe exhibit relational rather than individual properties. The result is a structure of immense complexity, a self-organizing and self-disorganizing fabric of converging and diverging strands, a harmonie that is simultaneously in and out of tune, fitting and not fitting together, a unity that is a plurality, differing and agreeing with itself. Neither whole nor not whole, the cosmos is simultaneously whole and not whole, an untotalizable sum that is forever alive and forever dying, exhausting and replenishing itself at every instant, in every entity, and with every transformation, not sequentially, but simultaneously. Now, the embarrassing fact that the human soul, endowed with the attributes of an interior self and a psychological richness within, would have to be conceived of as made of fire or evaporation, seems not to register among exponents of the dominant view of Heraclitus as the discoverer of the human self. What is more, Heraclitus's universe is populated by a far richer range of objects than ourselves. It includes literally everything, panta in Diogenes Laertius's words, from rivers, tides, mist, in the course of the sun, to roads, barley drink, fish, pigs, monkeys, dogs, asses, corpses, dung, circles, carting wheels, children's toys, bows, and wires. Man is decidedly not the measure of things. He is just one more object in the world. As it happens, earlier scholarship on Heraclitus was on a much better footing than current readings. Schleiermacher's uh, study from 1808 on Heraclitus notices how Heraclitus lost and then found himself again, not as a durable existent, as he says, but only in the logic of the universe in der gemeinsamen Vernunft. Everywhere, he writes, his theory privileges what is universal, dem Allgemeinen, while completely subordinating the particular as derivative of the universal and as non-existent in itself, end of quote. I'm sorry, these would have been presented to you in German and English, uh, had of the handout shown. Once lost, the individual self is not recuperated. It is found as das nicht ich, the not I, into which it is, has dissolved. Schleiermacher's term, das Allgemeine, like Gemeinsam, renders the foundational category in Heraclitus's thinking, toxunon, tokoinon in later Greek, which represents the all-commonality of nature. What Heraclitus is describing, as Schleiermacher recognizes, is an ecological commons. And in this, he was followed by Hegel, Nietzsche, and Snell in 1926, but no, in 1946. In stressing the environmental meaning of Toxunon, which is in fact premised on ancient testimony, Schleiermacher and his German following bring us closer to a Heraclitean ecology of the self and further away from humanistic readings of Heraclitus. The self on this alternative view is not a psychological entity teeming with a private inner life and depth, nor does it name an individual, individuum. On the contrary, the Heraclitean self, in quotation marks, exists in a purely extroverted form. It is turned outward, away from itself, and it faces the cosmos, which is the only reality that it knows and the source of all of its experiences, except for the fact that once this point is reached, there is no subject left to experience anything at all 
unless we were to say that it is the cosmos that experiences and thinks itself, not as a singular entity, and certainly not any essential and independent identity, but as a process of diverging and converging opposites. They cannot and that cannot be isolated as a totality. The Heraclitean world is a system of relational processes whose constituent beings literally belong to one another in common. They are Xuna. Heraclitus did not discover the self, neither did he discover the commons. Rather, he was, perhaps, the first to name the self as a property of the commons. The same concept, referred to as the koinon and communa in later Greek and Roman writers, is, I want to suggest, the key to a future vision of ancient notions of being and belonging, both in the commons of nature and in those of the civil world. Lest there should be any doubts about the ecological import of Heraclitus' theory, we need to turn to only turn to Sextus Empiricus, who attempts to the preeminence of environmental surroundings, to periacon, in the operation of the Heraclitean universe and in the constitution of the beings. Individuals, we learn, when they are cut off from the whole, this is from Sextus's paraphrase of Heraclitus, only imagine what they are thinking. But in reality, their thinking is a private, a false, and empty thinking, an idiom for an The iron is that once human beings relinquish their isolation and rejoin the whole in their minds, they cease to be individuals in any significant sense. They merely partake of the dominance. Heraclitus puts this in physiological terms. I regret that I don't require you to look at for Sextus, which is a testimony in, in Gilles Kranz. Um, in drawing in the divine logos of the cosmos, the air we breathe gives intelligence, gives us intelligence. Differently put, the source of that intelligence lies in our connectivity to what lies outside of us, which is everything that gives us life to begin with. The private self is a deprived self, whereas the waking extroverted self is fully alive and a full participant in the cosmic world. Aliveness here is established by the self's connection to nature, but also by its extroversion, the outward facing posture of the self. The price to be paid for intelligence is selfhood. And as we learn in the same passage from Sextus, self-identity. For once to periacon enters into ourselves, it appears like a foreigner xenos in our bodies. But this too is spoken from the perspective of the private individual itself, albeit one that says somebody become a stranger to itself. The upshot is clear to recognize our true constitution is to become self-estranged, or better yet, to become estranged from the intuitive concept of self that results from our ordinary sense of identity. What was once interior is now exterior, like a stock that has been turned inside out. Our intuitively familiar individuality now appears to have been expropriated to the greater whole of the environment. But that is not all, for with this move, not only does Heraclitus decenter the individual from human being from nature, but he also diminishes its presumptive powers. A privatized self, cut off from what is common, is alogos, deprived of intelligence, reason, and rationality. It has no insight into the enigmatic rationality of the universe, which is the only intelligence there is. Reason as such belongs not to individuals, but to the cosmos in the form of the externalized and exteriorized relations that comprise it. As he says elsewhere, and he repeats, fire, not ourselves, is what is it. Simply to share an, an insight, share an insight into the workings of the cosmos is to surrender one's sense of particularity and selfhood, indeed one's humanity, and to recognize one's partitive relationship to the whole. The point is not that human beings achieve cognition by virtue of participating in cosmic stuff, 
as Sextus and recent scholars assert, it is rather that humans achieve cognition by becoming inhuman. Where do we go from here? Posthumanism is one direction to take, but not the only one. What about Foucauldian self-care? That strikes me as a regressive step, precisely because of its insistence on the self. Regressive, but also dated as readers from Schleiermacher to the early Snell show, but also as two further quotations will drive home. And now I need to find those quotations for you. Second. Too bad uh, these wouldn't show, but anyway, I'll read the first, and then I'll read the second. Quote one, spirit is the absolute and universal inversion and alienation of actuality and of thought. It is pure cultural formation. It is a relinquished, selfless essence. It is the loss of its own self. Its alienation from itself is its self-preservation. The simple consciousness cannot demand of the individual that he withdraw from the world, for even Diogenes in his barrel is conditioned by it. To, man, to demand this of the individual is to demand exactly what counts as the bad, namely demand to demand that he care for himself as a singular individual. Now for quote two, one of the most persistent trends in modern philosophy since Descartes, and perhaps its most original contribution to philosophy, has been an exclusive concern with the self, an attempt to reduce all experiences with the world as well as with other human beings to experiences between man and himself. The first of these quotations is from Hegel's Phenomenology, the second from Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. What both thinkers share, even if they agree on little else, is that care for the self bespeaks a loss of world, what Amrit calls world alienation. It was quote Amrit, uh, into the security of an inward realm in which the self is exposed to nothing but itself. As in Epicureanism and Stoicism, so on our end, though she is wrong about these schools, but not among the ancient cynics, those citizens of the world, which is to say, individuals who are maximally exposed to the world, Hegel is completely right about that. Both Hegel and Arendt um, were defying the rising bourgeois neoliberal ego that was the product of a certain modernity and that reappears in Foucault's Kant-influenced theory of subjectivity. And yet both are closer in spirit to the kind of work that I believe can be used to reassess ancient thought about the self, not as an entity, but as a problem, which is to say, as a problematic concept and category that Pache, Foucault, fails to constitute itself in its relation to itself, what he calls relation à soi. What this alternative tradition demonstrates is how the self, the intuitive idea of a first personal consciousness, a Western construct to be sure, ultimately dissolves into its relations with others and with the world. That is the more promising path forward today. Now I'm going to wrap up. Contemporary theories of community, ecology, the post-human, plasticity, the queer, the racialized or the disabled inhuman, not to mention much of modern philosophy since Sartre and Bataille, have rejected the very idea of the self and its truth and have made the self's minimization and dissolution, not its care and fashioning, into an object of ethical concern. Studies of equity reared in this new environment are already beginning to discover antecedents to the rejection of first personal experiences and its grip on truth in the writings of the pre-Socratics and the Stoics. Socrates and the Cynics have not yet been so recognized. The object of concern here is not cells, but beings, ontological, elemental, political, racialized, and differently abled, yet always vulnerable beings. What these contemporary theories offer is a way to write for ourselves a new history of our own present. Even more significantly, they can offer us resources for reconceiving, reconceiving human identity 
as an integral part of nature and not as its antithesis or exception. Foucault's view of the ancient subject may not play a role any longer in this endeavor, but others will. These will give new life to our field as we learn to appreciate how the ancients were a little bit more modern and the moderns a little bit more ancient than was hitherto assumed. The future of the self lies here, perhaps not a future entirely without selves, but with self stripped of a privileged position in the democracy of things that we provisionally inhabit. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Porter. Um, we were not able to open and share your uh, document on our side either, so the problem must be with the document. Uh, we apologize about that, but thank you very much for uh, your talk. Please stay uh, connected uh, for a brief discussion after the end of the panel, and uh, thank you very much once again. Um, our next and final speaker, we move back from the Pacific coast to the old continent is Professor uh, Filippo Maria Pontani from uh, Ca' Foscari University of Venice, a professor of classics. And uh, uh, thank you very much for being here with us today, Professor uh, Pontani. Um, your title is in French, but I, not, I believe that you will not be speaking in French. Great. Thank you very much. We're all ears. The classics can console, but not enough. Back in 2017, amid the ruins of modern Nineveh, just liberated from the rule and the atrocities of the self-proclaimed Islamic State, the leading German playwright Milo Rau felt the need to dress in Greek garb, a sa manière, the aftermath of a collective plight that was to have a vehement impact on the social fabric of northern Iraq. The tribal foods, the thirst for revenge, the sense that justice had to be done, like Lysias after the Triaconta. In an unconscious reenacting of Pasolini's African Oresteia, Milo Rao thus came to the idea of involving a number of local citizens as, a, as alien to Western theater as one would expect them to be on the basis of Borges' famous dictum about Averroes' failure to understand drama in a performance of selected episodes from Ischlus Orestia, with a special focus on the Eumenides, Orestes in Mosul. Ischylus was no longer the poet of adultery, of family ties and sin, but rather the antonomasia for civil strife and its ongoing effects for the opposition between private vendetta and collective justice. No surprise that the actors who felt the killings and the Aeropagos court case as particularly germane to their spirits and lives developed all sorts of reactions to the plot, including violent ones, as shown in the beautiful documentary Orestes in Mosul, The Making of. The whole story ended in a single elderly Iraqi woman, an euhemerized Athena, whose husband had been killed during the IS occupation, proclaiming Orestes' acquittal and leaving the premises, heading for a camp in the city's outskirts where she was to school the children of the former IS fighters. Was this a right decision? Was the woman to pity or to blame? Was the national reconciliation thus fostered or effected? Milo Rao's taste for ancient prototypes finds comparanda both, both in his own oeuvre, I think of the Congo Tribunal, also reaching Greek overtones, and his forthcoming Antigone in the Amazons to be premiered in Ghent next spring. And in similar rewritings, one may just think of Yael Faber's Molora staging the South African Orestia in which the curse eventually comes to a stillstand to the rule of law. Yet Rao, does not use the ancient text as a shablone with a paideutic overtone as a means of instructing the audience. He rather experiments with this potential to trouble the actors as well as the audience, both local and European, and to bring up violently some questions that haunt two societies, 
colonialism, war, peace, forgiveness, environmental crisis, greed, violence, etc. This potential is clearly all the more relevant when the very text of a play originates outside Europe or on the margins of the Mediterranean pond. Cross the Rhine and take the leading French playwright, now director of Paris Théâtre de la Colline, Vajdi Mouavad. Born in Lebanon just before the war, then raised to a striking artistic career in Montréal, Canada, he has scattered classical allusions and motifs throughout most of his plays. One did just think of how much Oedipus, starting from the heels, lies behind Incendie, perhaps the most ambitious and successful play of this century, also in its cinematic version by Denis Villeneuve. Over the years, Moivad has staged the entire oeuvre of Sophocles, admittedly with uneven results, yet sometimes seasoning the play with a bold political stance. In his postmodern Oedipus at Colonus, called Les Larmes d'Edipe, the focal point and the trigger for Oedipus' tears and desperate revelation is one of the most tragic moments of recent Greek history, the 2008 murder of Alexis Grigoropoulos in the Dost Savela at Exarchia, just a few blocks away from where we are standing today. Although family ties, violence, and the big history of the Middle East are inextricably interwoven in Moavad's poetics, his only fully Greek play, namely a play with entirely Greek characters, is Le Soleil ni la mort ne peut se regarder en face, 2008. This is a Theban triptych on Cadmus, Laios, and Oedipus, collecting or interpolating parts of the plot and several scenes, either from lesser known mythographers or from the author's own invention. Cadmus' search for Europa after her abduction by a group of 20 masked men becomes a tale of exile and war. The war between the locals of Boeotia and Cadmus, the stranger who founds Thebes. The war of Pelops against Laios, whose undue passion for Chrysippus poses the issue of pederasty and homosexuality. The war of words, when Oedipus' victorious but awesome confrontation with his Sphinx highlights the centrality of language, and particularly of Cadmus' gift, the alphabet, in preserving human memory, the only antidote to our finitude and the only possible sense of our bloody fate. Cadmus, ne te trompe pas, les hommes toujours veulent le bonheur, mais dans la route minutieuse qu'ils tentent de suivre, une erreur se glisse, toujours la même, et il termine dans le sang. Cloaque époque, sphinge inexistante, dont nul ne parvenant à déchiffrer la nouvelle question, Comment faire cesser le saignement des dieux C'est un monde rouge, sans révélation aucune, qui va vers l'abysse des lumières. Guerre nouvelle, villes englouties, mouvement de mer, hécatombe de tous les animaux, famine et sécheresse. A knife handed by Athena over to Cadmus and then over to Laius and Oedipus, exile and displacement, ubiquitous blood, the weight of revelation, of the light that comes to the blind, brings to the service the relentless malignity of man and identifies the greatest danger in the removal or the pollution of memory and self-consciousness. Muavad's tragedy, reminiscent of Roberto Calasso and Maria Zambrano, sounds like a reminder to the world of man's de notes and a warning to the Lebanese. The civil war of 1975 to 1990 in their country was not une guerre des autres, as many politicians would like to present it. The local militias are down to this day the true arbiters of the country's fate. It was the outcome of the inherent wickedness of human nature, including the corrupt politicians, nothing to be forgotten or healed by shaky legends such as the alleged common Phoenician de descent, whether seasoned or not, with a touch of Bernalian black Athenism. Two weeks ago, in Rome, in front of a learned audience, the Irish poet Michael Longley, in deep concern for the Ukrainian war, revamped his 1994 poem, Ceasefire, published on the Irish Times the day after a preliminary truce between the IRA and the British state. While this reading of Iliad 24, recently picked up and enlarged by Michael Hughes' award-winning novel, Country, numbers to the most touching modern rewritings of ancient poetry, 
and it does so only as long as it is read against the background of the tragedy it silently evokes, I would like to stress what Longley added in his speech. As a schoolboy, I relished the Bronze Age music, the bumpy hexameters, the clash of the broad vowels, the way lips and tongue are vigorously exercised, hammer and tongs, and I adored the stories. It would be idle in front of this audience to insist on the need to know one's Greek, its grammar and its syntax in order to appreciate the genuine charm, the real originary meaning and polysemy of the ancient texts. But the stress on the physical aspects of the Homeric hexameters, already familiar to Alexandrian critics, reminds me of the importance of sound. The sound of Greek, of those words with all their historical weight, belongs to the joyous concert of tongues I heard years ago here in Athens on my walk to the Nikaiopolis Demos at the City Plaza Hotel on the Odossa Hanon, the best hotel in Europe. The sound of Greek brings to my mind the mishmash of poetical rhythms, including Greek, gathered by an American resident of this town, the outstanding poet Alicia Stallings, during her weekly soiree devoted to the poetic training of refugee women temporarily hosted at the Piraeus. The sounds of Greek reminds me of the night of 2016 when the stage of the Teatro Olimpico at Vicenza witnessed the performance of some lines from Timotheus' Drowning Persians, the lines with the half incomprehensible mornings of the Barbaroi, and immediately thereafter, the real voices of African migrants from the Gambia or Cameroon speaking fluent English or French with a very strong local accent, all the more peculiar when accompanying those people's terrible accounts of their adventurous journey through the desert and across the Strait of Sicily. There, in front of the gates of Thebes, as designed by Palladio and Scamozzi for the premiere of Sophocles' Oedipus Rex in 1585, there stood people who were slowly trying to recover, under the patient hands of an NGO from Verona, the human dignity they had lost in the camps of Libya. They are essentially the same people towering in the most merciless and at the same time realistic adaptation of Ischlus' suppliant women, namely the torrential, almost Bernhardian stage monologue by the Austrian Nobel Prize Elfriede Jelinek called the Schutzbefohlen the forced refugees. We try to read foreign laws. No one tells us anything. We do not get to know anything. We are parcels ordered but never picked up. We have to show up here and then there, but which country more benign than this one? We do not know any. Which country could we ever walk on? None. Embarrassed, we wait. Here, note the, the wordplay between betreten and betreten, to tread and embarrassed. In recent decades, it has become common for European left-wing intellectuals to advocate a more open policy towards migrants and refugees by harking back to the example of Pelasgos or to the splendid principles of Xenia laid down by the Phaeacians upon Odysseus' arrival. This has often been done, however, without taking into due account the meaning of ritual friendship in ancient societies as well as the difference between a one-to-one -one relationship between heroes and a mass migration that even our beloved forefathers may have easily termed as invasion, not to mention the plausibility of a discussion on citizenship or eus soli in the golden age of fifth century Athens. Here too, the greatest contribution to the revival of the ancient prism comes from those works which either, as in the case of Jelinek, use the ancient pattern as a foil for developing a very strong critical stance and uttering a harsh criticism of the hidden implications of our liberal democracies, or spell out the intricacy of the problems connected with migration at large, as was beautifully done by Yorgos Rivas in the Greek pavilion of the 2017 Venice Biennale. In the Rivas rewriting of Ischylus Supplicus, called El Rastillo di Limaton, Laboratory of Dilemmas, and starring Inter Alios Charlotte Rampling, the experiment with a colony of microorganisms to be injected or not injected in a body was a perfect kind of allegoria of our modern fear of the stranger, sometimes simply an ancestral act of defense 
and sometimes a more meditated or advantageous concern with the dangers of the new. Hence, a reflection on the deeper dynamics of exclusion and segregation that still operate in our societies. Is this not, after all, the background of Saint-Omer, the best film screened at September's Mosta del Cinema in Venice? Through a tense and profound elaboration of the Medea material, the director, Alice Diop, has dwelled at length on the seemingly inexpressive gaze of the protagonist, a young colored mother who is now being sentenced for the murder of her son. The fait d'hiver had actually happened in that village of Normandy, Saint-Omer, a couple of years earlier. Was it a moment of folly, the cowardice of her own Jason, the unease with a basically hostile human environment, a sense of black magic, Without resorting to the extreme of Tom Lanois' Belgian and South African Mama Medea, where the responsibility of the filicide is equally shared by the black Medea and by the civilized Jason, Saint-Omer keeps clear from rewriting Euripides' play, nor does it lead to any peaceful or heartening conclusion, but it rather presentifies the troubling aspects of myth and beautifully revives the perennial question looming around in this kind of debates why be moved by Medea rather than by similar cases in the press, as Herbert Golder once wrote? What is Hecuba to me, or I to Hecuba? On Sunday evening in Padua, I was sitting in a van with seven people. The woman leading our group in the dirtiest suburbs of the town, a Romanian prostitute who would approach real clients in front of our eyes, was in fact an actress of the Teatro dei Borgia, performing Medea. The method of the Borgia crew is to squeeze out of the ancient myths and plays a dramatic gist, a dramatic kernel, on which to build a story that is entirely imminent and pertinent to our own modern world. If Medea, a prostitute just like the heroine of Brett Bailey's Cape Town rewriting, if Medea thus becomes a herald of the difficult role and the unspeakable pain of foreign women in modern Western societies, in another monologue, Eracle l'Invisibile becomes a schoolteacher whose life collapses altogether in a very short time. Unjustly suspected of harassing a pupil, he loses in quick succession his job, his family, his substance, and his temper. Even more powerfully, perhaps, Filottete Dimenticato stages a former actor currently living in an asylum where his low and relentless dementia is treated with pills, his physical pain goes unnoticed or unbelieved, his very exact recollections of a glorious past drown in the present misery, and neither his son nor his family or friends ever come to drag him out of that island of nowhere. This metamorphosis of Sophocles' play I find particularly interesting because it entirely eschews the political dimension of, of Heiner Müller's or Chamosini's Philoctetes and projects the issue of isolation, regret, and despair in the frame of one of the greatest tragedies of our times, namely the future of an aging society, the intellectual and physical decay, the fate of one's beloved bodies eventually confined in a lemnos-like limbo. What a body is for in times like these is yours to guess or know. Her body was a new and ancient right. She felt her wanting grow, but could not reconcile her wants with what she knew she was. She let herself be touched, but not for pleasure, just because. It is not by chance that these lines belong to one of the most successful English poets, capable of reviving in her brand new ancients the old ideal of theoxony and of showing Aphrodite making love to a bartender or Iris drinking in an East End pub. Kay Tempest, formerly Kate, is one of the best known advocates of gender fluidity to the point of renouncing and mutilating her own name, and her adoption of Tiresias as an avatar of the LGBTQ sensibility chimes in with the massive adoption of this mythical character in contemporary homosexual discourse. It looks as if nowadays, after the Foucauldian turn and in the wake of T.S. Eliot and Geoffrey Eugenides, Tiresias had definitely taken the place of the traditional mythological symbols of the old Oxonian Hellenic masquerades, such as Ganymedes, Narcissus, Antinous, and Sappho. 
The controversial aspects of this figure, his unparalleled bisexual adventure, his proximity with Odysseus and the underworld, and his role as a mantis, all add to his pedigree. And it may be of some interest that every section of Tempest's book of Metamorphosis, called Hold Your Own, opens on a quotation from, again, Sophocles' line on Tiresias. The gods are all here because the gods are in us, famously shouted Tempest in one of her readings, and the idea of the divine she was evoking was as multiform as one might guess. I am not sure that classical studies are experiencing an impasse, but if that is the case, then my idea is that the way out is not to offer a consoling image of the ancient world, such as that presiding over the handbookish resumes or the alluring psychological paraphrases, whether well-written ones, such as Madeleine Miller's, or ineffably poor ones, such as Andrea Marcolongo's. That specific image, however often involuntarily, confirms the stereotypes, passes on a digested and conventional image without really provoking thought or doubts, and thereby leads, at least potentially, to a twofold outcome. Either to the typical, wary classicism of the white European elites, or, in the worst case, to slow nationalistic reappropriations of the past, of which there are still too many. For one thing, I do not know what to expect from the new reopening, after decades of neglect, of Augustus' mausoleum in the heart of Rome, in the exact location chosen by the fascist regime as the pivot of the continuity between the ancient Roman Empire and the new colonial enterprise in Africa. Nor do I know if the present Minister of Education of my country will propagate his theory about the Roman Empire being literally destroyed by immigrants or leave room to Maurizio Bettini's and others' alternative view of that historical period and of the dangerous issues of identity. What I do know is to what extent the Greek past of Panticapaion and nearby colonies has been presented by propaganda as the historical prophecies for the Russification of Crimea and southern Ukraine since the times of the illuminated ruler Catherine the Great, when the province of Novorossiya was first occupied and established, and Pidaric Odes in ancient Greek were written in praise of the towns of Sebastopol or Kherson, note their Hellenized names, or in praise of the national hero and Catherine's lover, Grigory Potemkin, whose mortal remains were smuggled away from Kherson's cathedral just a couple of weeks ago upon the Russians' apparent retreat. What I also know is that the most ideological urbanistic project of recent decades in Europe has been realized in the center of Skopje with a massive equestrian monument of Alexander the Great, now towering over a pantheon of marble statues, including Emperor Justinian, in an attempt to advocate for Northern Macedonia the classical and Byzantine heritage traditionally associated with present-day Greece. It is not just a matter of simply reacting to distortions or of studying the past in order to put things right, however necessary this undoubtedly remains. Equally important is to get a grasp of how much classics can trouble us of their immense potential in asking unusual questions of our history, our beliefs, our mores. I'm happy to live in a world where the study of the Greek or Latin world does not need any excuse, any preliminary hemung, or any apology per se. Those who have put it to a wrong use should, of course, be blamed, and so should those who have manipulated the Celtic, the Saxon, or any other heritage in order to press or vilify their neighbor. Indeed, some of the intellectuals who now target classics in principle may have learned a lot about imperialism from Thucydides' Million Dialogue or about Philoxenia from Book Six of the Odyssey. I'm happy to live in a world where, as Salvatore Settis once put it, the classical heritage is and remains perhaps the only sizable global cultural object of self-reflection and the only unceasing spur to creativity shared by so many different cultures, if in varying degrees and with various reactions, including rejection. And I believe that precisely because of this immense power, the classical heritage is strong enough to give the word to everyone, including those who would wish to overturn it. The aforementioned experience with the migrants at Vicenza Teatro Olimpico stems from an initiative that have been running since 2010, together with my colleague Alberto Camerotto, first in Veneto and then throughout Italy, 
a project that has won the support of dozens of colleagues of secondary school, the Liceo Classico, and has thus reached thousands of schoolboys and students. Alberto called it, with a somewhat ambitious sense of provocation, Classici Contro, Classici Cata, as reads the first volume of our series, translated into Greek under the patronage of our friend Nikos Mosconas. In several, several memorable evenings over the years, we had jurists presenting on contemporary antigons, comedians poking fun at Berlusconi's Petronian parties, writers pondering on truth, Mexican poets tackling the theme of oikologia and eco-poetry, a dangerous topic to be treated in Latin America, we learned, and above all, a host of fellow classicists attempting to map the objects of their academic research onto the world out there, admittedly with uneven results, always with some deeper sense of involvement and the ambition to make these texts mean something to the young, sometimes very young audience in front of us. In so many years, I hardly remember a more touching experience than listening in the beautiful theater of small Cittadella to the paper of a colleague from Rome, Professor Cristina Pace, who on top of her curricular duties also regularly teaches classics at Rebibbia, the high security prison at the outskirts of Rome. Cristina told us about the essay on the Oresteia written by Giovanni, a formerly illiterate boss of the Neapolitan Mafia, who before repenting, alas too late, had shared for several years the values and deeds of the worst criminal milieus. Line after line, Cristina said, it became apparent that that man needed no imagination or instruction in order to understand deeply the mechanism of war and revenge violence and vendetta, omnipotence and fragility. He had eventually found in Ischylus' text the exact representation of the world he had been living in for too many years before ending up in a cell for the rest of his life. Tuttavia, la tragedia non è poesia che fa la morale, ma mostra le cose come sono, anche le più terribili, e le difficoltà degli uomini nel vivere. Nessuno è tutto buono o tutto cattivo. Questa constatazione, che Aristotele faceva nella poetica a proposito del personaggio tragico, corrisponde a una constatazione che si sperimenta nella vita. Onnipotenza e fragilità sono due caratteristiche intrinseche della natura umana che si alternano nello scorrere della nostra vita e con cui ognuno di noi deve fare i conti. Onnipotenza e fragilità, bellezza e orrore, è questo che la tragedia mette in evidenza ed è per questo che la poesia e il teatro potrebbero essere fondamentali per la vita delle persone. In this surprising encounter with a non-bookish dimension of ancient tragedy, there was Einfühlung. An Einfühlung that clearly spills from Giovanni over to Cristina and from her onto her audience and perhaps onto the present one. Are the gods still around us? Are Pindar, Aeschylus, and Homer materially living with us? The real Einfühlung is not the Hamogila Puden Pochum Tonagalmaton, not even the marble rhetoric of the building we are in today, or of Schliemann's aristocratic Ilium Melathron round the corner. Einfühlung is the sudden thought of the Homeric Nes Kuanoperoi when I collected this piece of wood from the wreck of a wooden boat on the shore of Lampedusa. Einfühlung is the world is the word Alilengi. Is the word Alilengi, I read Ex Amphotern Pistis, says Ezekius. I read on a van stuck in the middle of the refugee camp at Idomeni back in March 2016, when part of Europe still thought that wir schaffen das. Einfühlung is a sense of a global world, world in Nuce, with all its troubles, when I saw the location of Miliagers and Philodemus and Manipus homeland, Gadara or Umalkais, which lies on the boundary between three countries down to this very day. Einfühlung is the memory of Homeric verb taken up in Hippocrates, plix, a placental, when I saw the position taken by my mother on her deathbed during the very last hours of her life. If the muses, as Philippos Ioanno puts it in the epigram here next door, dor au elenon pesi nemusi fila, then let them, as once again the Caribbean Vatis would put it, bring nobody peace 
at least not the sleepy peace we have been relying on for too long. And in this mild autumn of our discontent, let the muses sing with the voice of Mahmoud Darwish, perhaps the last poet capable of becoming a legend for his people and of bequeathing the ancient Mediterranean words, Arabic as well as Greek words, to us Nakeborene. Si cet automne est le dernier, demandons pardon pour le sac et le ressac de la mer, pour le souvenir, pour ce que nous avons fait de nos frères avant l'âge du bronze. Nous choisirons ce phoque avant Imru al kais quelle que soit la métamorphose des figues des pâtres, quelles que soient les prières élevées à César par nos frères et ennemis précédents, unis dans la célébration des ténèbres. Il faudra une mémoire pour que nous oublions et pardonnions quand adviendra la paix entre nous et entre la gazelle et le loup. Il faudra une mémoire pour qu'à la fin nous choisissions ce phoque qui brisera le cercle et il faudra un jument sur les places de cet ennissement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pontani. And now we all know why you chose the particular title for your talk. Uh, technically, the two-hour space allotted to the session is just completed, but I guess because we began a little earlier, we may, I don't know, take a few minutes for a few questions. If there are any pressing questions, the attendees need to address. Yes, 10 minutes, not more. And if there are pressing questions. Well, I guess there are no questions. We're all spellbound, and we have been presented with a lot of issues to ponder as we prepare for the next three days. Uh, I would like to thank every one of you, and every one of you for your presence here, our esteemed colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed guests. And uh, before we uh, close the session, an announcement. Uh, for the speakers of the conference, please uh, wait, don't leave, and please gather at the entrance of the academy for, uh, uh, because the whole group will go together to the conference dinner venue. Thank you very much, and I hope to see all of you tomorrow for the second day.